hi, welcome everybody. Um, while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, um, I'm using buses as my theme today, so I thought it'd be fun to find out where your last bus journey took you. And I'm in the UK, and rather classically, mine was taking my children um, in London from um, Piccadilly Circus to Marble Arch, which they, which they really enjoyed because they don't go on buses very often. So it was um, quite novel for them. Anyway, so if you'd like to share your last bus journey, um, give me an idea of where everyone is in the world, then please put it in the chat, but you don't have to if you don't want to share. That's fine. For anyone who doesn't know me already, my name is Claire and I'm one of the TAs at Launch School. I'm also a student and I'm just over halfway through the Ruby track. Now, before we get started, I just want to give a quick plug for Launch School's women's group. There's a Slack channel for this group open to all women in the prep courses and beyond. We meet every three weeks. Our um, last meeting was last Sunday, so there'll be one um, in a couple of weeks time. Um, so if you fancy joining in, all the details are in the Slack channel, LS Women's Group, um, or you can find the meetings in the events calendar. Now, this is the third in a series of introductory workshops. Ruby, Brandy gave the last two. Um, concurrently, we're also running workshops on JavaScript and miscellaneous topics such as study tips and Git. Don't worry if you weren't here for the first two Ruby workshops. These sessions are standalone, so you'll be able to follow along. Um, and these workshops complement Launch School's programming and back-end Ruby course. We'll skim over some of the more complex ideas, but this workshop should give you a flavour for Launch School and what to expect, but it's not a substitution for working through the course materials. So let's have a look at what we will be working through today. So we're going to be having a um, look at what flow control is. We're going to be looking at comparison operators. They're used... Um, in if statements and case statements, which we'll go on to. Then we're going to finish up by looking at simple loops and then other loops as well. There, so if you have any questions as we go along, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat where they can get a little bit lost. I'll try to answer them as we go along because I don't want to leave anyone behind. So please ask questions as we go. There will be time at the end for further questions. And I'll also post a link to a feedback form so that you can let us know um, how this session went and what to improve for next time, what to continue doing, what works well. Um, so I'm gonna put that in the chat now. So if there's anyone that needs to hop off early then you can grab that form before you go. Uh, I'd be grateful if you would all fill that in. We really use the information that you put on those forms and it, it has, you know, I think it's maybe the fourth time I'm doing this now. And I've got some really useful feedback that I've incorporated into this. Now, if you want to code along with me, then please go ahead, but don't worry if it doesn't work for you. I'll be using multiple choice quizzes throughout to keep things nice and interactive. Um, but those quizzes are just for fun. They're anonymous, no one's keeping records or anything. I'll be working in AWS Cloud9, which you can see on the left of your screen. Um, this just provides a website where we can program easily. And AWS is, is good for beginners because it's all in one place. Now we're gonna look at two main ideas today, flow control and loop. So we're going to look at flow control first. So let's have a look, what is flow control? So this relates to changing the flow of program execution away from just executing every line of code from top to bottom to changing what code is executed in different circumstances. Now, a useful analogy is to think of flow control as a journey. So during the journey, there may be forks in the road that require decisions to be made to decide which path to follow. And in Ruby, this is achieved using conditionals. And these can be formed using a combination of if statements and comparison operators to determine which branch in a computer program to take. So looking at the flow diagram in the student notes, we could use a conditional to check whether we would like to take the scenic route. And depending on the answer, we either take the branch for the long windy roads or the one for fast roads. So let's take a look at comparison operators before we start to use them in if statements. First of all, a bit of terminology. The operands are the things being compared. So it's the four and the six in that example. And the operator is the type of comparison that's being undertaken to compare the two operands. And then also comparison operators 
always return a Boolean value. So it's, they return true or false. And so the example in the student notes there, because four is less than six, this would return true. So in cloud nine, I'm going to demonstrate some examples that use comparators. So I'm going to type IRB into the command line. And this opens up the interactive Ruby environment where we can just write Ruby code and press enter to execute it without having to create and execute files. So we can just do some simple ones. So if we just do um, two greater than seven, isn't so we get false as we would expect. We can also use these comparators on strings. So is A less than B? Yes, it is. So strings are compared. When strings are compared, it's equivalent to alphabetical sorting. So A is considered to be less than B because it would appear first in the alphabet. Um, you need to be careful when um, comparing, say, strings that are actually, um, or numbers that are actually strings, because here it compares them character by character. So in the, the first character is a four on both sides. So it dismisses that one and looks at the next character. And so on the left-hand side, it's two, and on the right-hand side, it's zero. So Ruby actually thinks that 402 is less than 42, which is why when we do 42 less than 402, we get false. So you just need to be careful when comparing numbers that are actually strings. Ruby is doing it character by character. Um, and then it's also useful to know that you can't sometimes um, compare two different types of data. So if we do a string compared to a number, we get here um, an error because there is no method for comparing strings and numbers. So whilst these operators look like operators, they're at, under the hood. They're actually methods. So we are reliant on whether or not the methods exist. Um, and then also let's have a look. So we could do is four greater than or equal to five. No, it isn't. That's false. Um, and then another common operator to look at is the equality operator. So is two the same as three? No, it isn't. But is two the same as two? Yes, it is. And again, you can compare strings. So if we do is hello the same as hello, we get yes, it is. But we need to be careful because these are case sensitive. So if we change the case of one of the letters in one of the strings, then we get back false. So they're not the same. And then another useful operator. So this is comparing if things are the same. There's also the not operator. We can do two, do the exclamation mark or bang is two not equal to two. And this not equal just returns the opposite of what the double equals does. So in this case, because two is equal to two, it would usually return, well, it would always return true. And because we've changed that to the not equals two, it will return false. So all of these are things that we can use when we're um, comparing things in our if statements. So before we do that, let's have a quick quiz. Um, give this your best shot, given what we've just learned. Um, I'll go through the answers after because I've not demonstrated everything here. So um, this is a good chance to just give things a go and see what you think will happen. So I'm just going to launch that poll here and just give it a go. Might clear system. Yeah. I'll just give you another um, minute or so to go through those. Mm. 
I'll just give you another 20 seconds or so. If I'm not giving you um, long enough for these quizzes, please um, put something in the chat to let me know and I'll make sure I'll give you a bit longer. I don't want everyone sitting around twiddling their thumbs if you've all finished. Okay, so let's have a look at the answers there. So if I end the poll, I can share the results so you can see how you all did. But just remember, I can't see who did what. And then we've got the answers up here. So for the first one, 101, less than two, and that's just comparing two integers, so that's false because 101 is bigger than two. 34 greater than or equal to 34, that's true because they're the same. Uh, question three, ant less than B. So when comparing strings, each letter is compared in turn because A is less than B because it's earlier in the alphabet, that returns true, ant is less than B. Uh, question four, we've got Ruby is less than or equal to Ruby. That's true because they are equal to each other. And then the last three. So for question five, we've got 5.0. So we've got a float there and we're comparing it to an integer five. And Ruby is clever. Ruby knows that these are the same value and so returns true, even though they're different data types, even though one is a float and one is an integer. The method exists and it's able to tell that they are the same value. However, moving on to question six, when you try to compare the integer five with the string five, Ruby returns false and says they're not the same. So anytime you um, compare integers and strings, you will always get false. So that's worth bearing in mind because that can be a source of errors. Um, and then question seven is the integer five less than the string six. This actually raises an error because there is no less than method defined to compare integers and strings. Okay, now the different um, combinations of operands and operators are not something you need to memorize. So don't worry if you didn't get all of those correct. What I'm getting across here is to be aware that when you use these operators, there are some subtleties to how they work. So if an if statement isn't working as you thought it would, it may well be down to the operator not working as you expected, rather than any complex logic you've got in there. So it's always a good place to look for bugs. And you know, if you're not sure how something works, then you just try it out in IRB or look in the Ruby documentation and you can see how these comparison operators work. So that's just to show that there are a few gotchas in there that you need to be careful of. So now we understand comparison operators, we're going to look at if statements. So the flow diagram in student notes is um, an example of what we can build using an if statement. And we're going to code the top part to begin with. So first of all, to get out of interactive Ruby, we just type exit. That gets us back to the command line. We're going to create a new Ruby file to put our code in. So we use the command touch to create a file. And I'm going to call it bus. And then it ends with the um, extension RB because it's a Ruby file. So I've just created bus RB. So if I go into the file tree, you can see that's what I've just created there. So if I double click to open it up, I'm now going to put some code in there. Now, if you're coding along, I'm going to put a link to the code in the chat. So you don't need to type this all out. You can just click on that link and then copy the code in. So it should look something like this. Maybe I've made this a little bit too big. Let's zoom out. There we go. So let's have a look at the syntax. So the first line, we've got a local variable called destination and we're assigning it to the string London. And then we've got an if block defined on lines three to five. So on line three, we're comparing destination with a double equal sign to the string London. And if that is true, then the code on uh, line four is executed. So we're using the put s method here, which just outputs to the um, command line. So it will output get on bus. So if I just save that and then run it, we're expecting this to say get on bus because destination is assigned to London and then we're comparing to see if they are. So to run that file, my command line will go a little bit squiffy because I've zoomed in and it just confuses um, Cloud9 a little. So I will keep 
type in clear to um, clean it up so it doesn't look so strange. So let's run the file. Ruby, bus.rb. See, this says get on bus, which is what we expected. Now, <clears throat> if we quickly change the destination, say, to Paris, so it's no longer set to London. If we go in here, I'll press the up arrow to get the previous command back, press equal, so nothing is output. So we can see here, this is working as we expected. When destination is London, line four is executed. And when it isn't London, nothing happens, it's not executed. Now, before we move on to more complicated examples, let's have a look at some alternative syntax with some simple if statements by refactoring this example. So again, I'm just going to paste a link in the chat. If you're coding along. And here, I'll just paste it in here. So I'm just going to comment this out because we can actually replace those three lines with this just one line. Let's expand this so you can see the whole line. Um, so here we can have destination. Um, there's an if at the beginning there, which you need to see, that's important. There we go. If destination um, is set to London, we have a keyword then, and then we've got the code put S, get on bus, and then end. So you can see it's actually got all of the same text that we had in lines three to five um, with an extra then, but it is all on one line. So if I save this, actually I'll change that back to London so we can see it working in. So if I've got destination set to London, then this should output get on bus. So let's just check that's what happens. Yes, it does. So we can see this is exactly the same as those three lines there, but it's just on one line. Um, and then we can also put the code in the reverse order. So again, I'll just put a link in there if you want to grab that and copy this. So if I just comment this line seven out, and here you can see this is even shorter. We've got the um, code that you want to execute first, the put on, put, put S, get on bus, if destination is all to London. And this, this is one that we see more often. The syntax on line nine is more common than the syntax on line seven. But remember, all three versions of this all do exactly the same time, exactly the same thing. They're just um, different ways to write the same thing. And this is just an example of Ruby's syntactical sugar. This is one of the reasons why it's such an expressive language, because you can do the same things in different ways, depending on what you're comparing. If you're trying to do um, much more complex comparisons and you're doing many lines of code, then the if end block on lines three to five would be more suitable. But for something simple like this, what we're doing on line nine is perfectly valid and arguably a bit easier to read. So let's elaborate on our example now to include an else condition. So again, I'm just going to copy the link into the chat. And then just paste this in. So I'm just going to get rid of all this code. I'm just going to replace it with um, something similar, but that has got an else condition. So here, what is happening is when the if condition is met, line four is executed. But if it isn't met, then line six is executed. So I've got here the destination is set to Paris. And I'm comparing to see if, it, if it's set to London. And so we would be expecting line six to be executed because this condition destination London is not met. So let's just save that. And then if we execute it, we get what we expect, wait for next bus. And so we've seen um, a simple if condition, we've now added an, el an else. And another thing you can do is have multiple else if conditions. So again, I'll just copy that link. 
put it in the chat. And then I'll copy the code in. So here um, we set the destination to a new destination, Windy Nook. Um, we've got the if condition, which always needs to start it at the top. We've got the end at the bottom, which always needs to come at the bottom. Um, the last condition there is always else. If you have an else, it has to go at the end. And then you can have as many else ifs as you like in there. You can have none or you can have lots. So it works the same as the if condition that if the condition is met, then the lines after it are executed. So here, because the destination is set to Windy Nook, um, line three won't be met. So then it will check line five, line five, that condition will be met. So we would expect line six to be executed. So it should output grab a code. So let's just check that happens. So I've saved the file. And then I executed it and we've got grab a code. So that's worked. Now, another thing to note is that if more than one branch is met. So here we've got line five and line seven met. We might think, oh, well, are both lines six and eight going to be executed or just line six or just line eight? So if we execute this, we can find out. It still says grab a code. And that's because when Ruby comes to a condition within an elf and if um, statement that is met, it executes that code and then exits out of the if the if statement. It doesn't check any of the other conditions. Once it's met one, it does that and moves on. And that's worth remembering because again, that can be an area for um, errors to creep in. It's it's quite easy to do if you're creating something quite long um, to overlook that something earlier on has been met when you want something later on to be executed. So just be aware that if Ruby isn't quite doing what you expected, maybe it's because it's, it's getting out of your if statement earlier than you realized. So I think we've done quite a lot of um, looking at if statements there. So let's have another quiz just on if statements this time. So, launch this one. This is just three questions here. I need to make sure you can see all of the code. There we go. Hopefully, that's not too small. Maybe I should just let me the heading view. There we go. So, give these a go. Quite a bit of code to um, look through there, so I'll give you another um, minute or so. Okay, just give you another 10 seconds or so. Do shout if I'm not giving you long enough. Okay, let's have a look at the answers. Wow, someone just snuck in there just as I was ending the poll. So well done. You timed that perfectly. You gave yourself maximum time to think about it. Right, let's have a look at the answers. So for question one, um, we're looking for what is going to be output when we execute this code. So fruit is set to pair, um, which isn't the if um, condition isn't met. So the else branch would be output. So it'll be, I'm sad it's not grapes. 
For question two, grade is set to 55. So we've got this um, if statement on one line, which I showed you, um, but the condition isn't met. Um, 55 is not greater than 90. So nothing will happen. Nothing will be output. And everybody got that right. Brilliant. Um, and then the last question, we've got temperature is set to 25. And so this one's interesting because it will meet two of these branches. It will meet the um, comparing temperature to 25 and also whether it's less than or equal to 25. As I explained earlier, the first branch will be executed. None of the others will be tested. So this will output just right. Excellent. Well done, everyone. So let's move on to case statements. So we've got a similar looking um, diagram here. And essentially, case statements work in the same way as if statements, but with slightly different syntax that is sometimes useful to use. So let's convert our bus example here into a case statement. So I'll paste a link to the code in here. And I will... I'm not going to manually do this. I don't think you need to watch me type it out. I'm just going to paste the code in. But you'll see that it's very similar. So again, we're, we're setting destination right at the top um, of the file. And then <clears throat> rather than having if destination equals London, we just do case destination. So we're, we're setting the variable that we're comparing against right at the top. And then we have these when um, conditions. So when it's London, execute line five. When it's Windy Nook, execute line seven. When it's Paris, execute line nine. And if none of those are met, then you have an else statement as well, which just like the if um, statement, else is optional. You don't always have to have an else, but you can have one. And just like with the um, else ifs, you can have, um, well, else if you can have none of them. Um, in a case statement, you do need at least one when statement for it to make sense, but you can have multiple of them. So in a way, they work just like the else if ones. And the same thing happens that if there's more than one condition is met, Ruby will just um, exit out once it finds the first one it meets. So if I just save that, what to expect to happen? We expect um, line eight, that's the line that's going to be, that's the condition that's going to be met. So this should output, don't be silly, you can't get a bus to Paris from where I live. Um, so if I just press the up arrow, that's what we get, don't be silly, you can't get a bus to Paris. Um, and if we can see that compared to an if statement, this is quite useful because we only had to specify the local variable that we're comparing against once, and we haven't needed to give the operator the double equals um, each time. So it's saved a bit on that as well. So in that case, this is easier to do. But if you wanted to do um, different comparisons on different lines, you can do that. Um, I don't know why you would do this um, in this particular case, but if you're comparing numbers, obviously you might do this. Um, if you want to, you can use this like an if statement where you can be comparing different things on different lines, but then you do lose a lot of the advantages of using a case statement, which is that you can just specify the local variable once and it automatically does look for and the double equals the equality of the local variable and the values that you pass to the when without having to specify that. But otherwise, this is very similar to a, um, an if statement. So I don't think I need to dwell on it too much. So let's go ahead and do another quiz. Again, I just need to make sure. Yeah, there's nothing missing off the bottom of example three. What you can see there is everything. So let's launch this poll. Give it a go. Yeah. 
There is a bit of code there to read, so that will give you another minute. Sorry. Another 20 seconds or so. Okay, so I'm just going to end that there and then share those results. Okay, let's have a look at the answers then. So for this first question, um, this is demonstrating what happens when none of the conditions are met. So um, the vegetable is a Brussels sprout. Um, that is neither a corn on the cob or a cucumber. So neither of the when conditions are met. So just like in this statement, nothing happens, which everybody got correct. Well done. Question two, this is demonstrating um, when multiple conditions are met, only the first one is executed. So this will output skis, which again, everybody got correct. And then question three, this one, um, oh, one person got this, well done. Um, this will raise an error because there's no end at the end. So maybe this is a bit of a trick question. Um, but I did hint that there wasn't anything missing below. But anyway, um, I'm just trying to mix it up and keep you on your toes. So just like with the statements, case statements do have to finish with an end and you will get an error if you don't. If an end had been there, Everybody would have, um, everybody else would have got this right yeah, and chose coolest language in the world. And that is what would have been output. So well done. Um, but just when you're writing your code, make sure that when you create your case statements, your if statements, that you make sure there's an end in there. Because if you've got a whole heap of code and there are um, ends here, there and everywhere, so things, it can get a bit confusing as to where the end is missing. So get into the habit of putting them in as soon as you put the case or the if statement at the top, put the end in at the bottom, and then you won't have that problem. Okay, so we're now going to um, look at loops. So if and case statements control the flow of the program, um, but they still work top to bottom, it's just you might not execute everything or anything. Um, in between the top and the bottom, whereas loops allow us to execute lines of code repeatedly. So we're going to explore the simplest loop syntax using the loop method. Um, I'm going to do this in a new scenario, which I can make this window a little bit smaller now. Um, in a new scenario that is going to be waiting for us, as you can see there. So let's create a new file. So it's going to be waiting. Dot rb. Don't need this open anymore. So if I double click, I've now got waiting there. So I'm going to paste a link to the code in the chat for anyone coding along. And then just paste the code in to the file. So let's have a look at the syntax. So loop is a method. Um, so it's not a keyword like the if and the case were, it's actually a method. Um, and the curly brackets are defining a block because it's coming after a method invocation. So it's a block. And the block is just code that is defined. So um, a little bit like putting code in a method and executing it, a little bit like putting code inside the if statements and stuff. When this is executed, the code inside the block is executed. So if I just save that, 
and then go over to the command line and do Ruby waiting.rb and execute it. You can see I've got into an infinite loop here. So you need to do control C to exit out of that. Now it's important to be able to know how to exit out of loops because no matter how long you've been coding, you're still going to create infinite loops every now and then. We all do it. So you need to know how to get out of it. So it's control C. And the issue there is just that I've got a loop and just do that. So it just does it over and over and over. There's nothing in there to stop it doing that. So to stop a loop being infinite, we can put a, a keyword in called break. So let's have a look at that in action. So again, if I just copy a link to the code there and then paste the code in here. So here, rather than using curly braces to um, define the block, I'm using a do and an end. So they're both ways to define a block that work the same. We don't need to worry about differences between them. Um, but the do end enables you to put more than one line of code. The curly braces are brilliant for writing really succinct, concise code, but it only works if the code you want to put inside the block is on one line. If you want to do multiple lines, then you use do and end. So this, what this is going to do, it's going to um, start the loop it's going to execute line two and output that message then it's going to come to break immediately and when it comes to break it comes out of the loop what's interesting here is that it doesn't come out of the file it doesn't come out of the program execution altogether it just comes out of the loop so line six will be executed so let's have a look at that again if i just Maybe I will clear the screen so that this is near the top. Oh. So we can see we get wait for the next bus. It just happens once and then catch that bus. OK, because we just had an immediate break. So let's explore a loop with more complicated example that follows this flow diagram here in the student notes. So let's just going to copy a link to the code into the chat, and then I'll copy and paste the code in. Okay. So what's going on here? So let's widen that. Yeah. So we have got time until bus is a local variable that we're setting to three. We've then got a loop being defined from lines three to line 12. Then on line four, we are reassigning time until bus to be one less. So this is going to decrement by one each time we go round the loop. Then on line six to nine, we've got an if statement that we learned about earlier. So we're going to um, check whether or not time until bus is zero. If it is, we're going to output a message and then break out of the loop. We're not just breaking out of the if statement, we're going to break out of the loop. So we'd go back down here. But if that condition isn't met, we're going to go down here, execute line 11, which will output how many minutes are left. And then we're going to go round and do it again and decrement time until bus by one again. So let's save that and execute it see what's going to happen. So we get two minutes until next bus, one minute until next bus, bus arrived all aboard, which I think is what we expected. It starts at three, it's immediately decremented to two, doesn't meet this, we get two minutes until next bus, it goes round, it's decremented to one. This condition isn't met, we get one minute until the next bus, going round again, it's now decremented to zero, this condition is met, we get bus arrived all aboard, and then we break out and there's nothing else to execute. Now, in addition to the break keyword for controlling loops, there's also the next keyword. And next just skips the rest of the code in the current iteration and just goes to the start of the next iteration. So that's quite a useful thing to be able to do sometimes. So I'm just going to copy and paste link in there 
and copy and paste. Load in there. I'm going to have to make this a bit smaller to fit it all in. There we go. Just about squeezed on there. So what have we got going on here? So we've we've got all the stuff we had before, actually. The only thing I've added is an extra if statement so that I could show you what happens with next. So when time until bus is um, equal to one, we get a different message and then next happens. And because next happens, it will skip the rest of this. So it won't check whether or not it's um, time until bus is equal to zero and it won't execute line 16. So when time until bus is one, we won't get one minute until next bus because that line won't be executed because the next happens and we'll just go back round again. So let's have a look and execute that. So that's good. What I said would happen has happened. So we've got two minutes until the next bus, then the bus is nearly here. Stop looking at your phone, bus arrived all aboard. That's what we expected because the first time we go round, it starts at three, it will be decremented to two, Neither of these are met, so we get two minutes until the next bus. It's decremented to one. The first if condition is met, so we get the bus is nearly here. Stop looking at your phone. Next, so we won't look at anything else. We'll just go straight up to here. Decrement it to zero. This condition is no longer met, but the condition on line 11 is. So we get bus arrived all aboard, and then we break out of it so we don't get line 16 executed again. Excellent. Right, so... Let's have a quick quiz to check our understanding of the loop method now. So, let's have a look there. So, this is just two questions, and you're going to need me to show you the code for those. Here we go. There we go. I can squeeze it all in. So, give these your best shot. I can see some answers are coming in now. A bit of a nervous wait for me to see um, whether or not I've got the questions correct and you can do them and stuff. But once people start putting in the answers, I go, oh, it's fine. Not, there's quite a lot to work through there, so I'm going to give you another minute. Okay, let's end that poll and share it. And then have a look at the answers. So for the first question, um, this loop is incrementing in steps of five, which I hadn't shown before. Um, so it's asking what is the last message output? So this is going to keep looping until the if statement of sunflower greater than 20 is met because that is where the break statement is. And so I'm all grown is going to be the last thing that's output. It's going to put I'm growing when sunflower height is 5, 10, 15, 20. And then after that, it's going to be assigned to 25. 
and um, the if statement will be met. And so I will run will be output and then it will come out of that. And then for question two, um, this is decrementing um, by one, but actually, unlike the example I showed you before, the decrementing is happening after the other things. And this was also showing a slightly different syntax here, um, where rather than we've got um, here where we're doing if, else, and break, we've just got it all on one line. So break if days equals zero. So if you don't need an else, um, statement because you don't need two different things if you just have one thing going on if the if statement is met we can put this all on one line so we've got we want it to come out of this loop when days is equal to zero so that won't happen on the first one so we'll get three days until payday then it will be decremented to two then we'll have two days until payday it will be decremented to one one day until payday it will be decremented to zero and then it will break because days is, is zero. So this will execute three times. Do appreciate it. it's quite hard to do in your head. Um, so well done to everyone who got that right. Okay, so for our final section, and gosh, this hour goes quickly for me, um, let's look at some other types of loops. So Ruby um, provides several other ways to loop, including while, until, and then the classic for, um, which is my favorite. Um, and we're just going to have a look at um, more detail, look at the while loop. Um, once you understand the loop that we've done here and a while loop, you'll be fine with all the others. So let's just close that file down. So we're going to create a new file. So I'm going to call this passengers.rb. So if I go into the file tree, open that up, and then I'm just pasting a link for the code. There, and then paste the code. makes it smaller so you can actually see what we're modeling here so this is the scenario that we're um coding up here so if we look at the syntax um similar to, to the if and the while so if we set up our local variable at the beginning so we're setting count to zero and then we've got while so a bit like if we've got a condition straight after it so while count is less than zero execute these things so we're going to increment um, count by five. We're going to put welcome aboard. There are five passengers in total and go around again. It will be incremented because it's five on that second time round. Um, it's still less than 10. So then it gets incremented to 10, we get welcome aboard, 10 passengers in total, go around again. Now the count is 10. It's no longer less than 10. So we don't execute it again. And then we carry on with the rest of the file. So we'll get we're full. So if I save that and then execute it. So Ruby passengers, we get, as I said, so we get welcome aboard, five passengers, welcome aboard, 10 passengers, and then we're full. So that's executed as we would have expected it. Now, the while loop is different to the loop method that we looked at previously because we didn't need to use a break keyword to end the looping. Um, that is taken care of by the condition that we're putting with the while keyword there. But beware, you can still make while an infinite loop, just like you can with loop, if you don't ensure that the while condition will be not met at some point. So if we did, um, we change the less than 10 to greater than or equal to zero. So it starts at zero and it's just going up, it's just gonna keep going. Um, if we execute that, we can see we're just gonna go on forever. I'm just gonna um, do control C. So just because you don't need a break statement in a while to, in a while statement, don't need a break keyword in a while statement to exit out of it, 
it doesn't mean that you can't still create an infinite loop. So be careful that your while condition will not be met at some point to prevent that happening. So as I said before, we've not looked at all the different types of loop, but they all follow these principles and this should get you started. All the other types are explained in Launch School's Ruby course. There are lots of exercises in there to get you practicing with these as well, um, giving you scenarios so you can figure out which is the best type of um, syntax to use. And practice is key. So let's have a look. What have we covered? We looked at what flow control was. So it was um, normally programs without flow control, programs just execute from top to bottom. With flow control, we can just have parts of it executed. And we looked at comparison operators, which are then used in the if and case statements. And then we looked at um, a simple loop that helps you go round and round. So the if and case statement, you're still going from top to bottom, but you don't execute every line of code. Whereas simple loops and other loops, I mean, able you to go round and repeatedly execute code. Now, don't worry if you didn't follow all of it. Each time you're exposed to a topic, it will become more familiar and meaningful. But to finish off, just wanted to give you all a chance to ask questions. If you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A. And while we're waiting for that, let's have a last roundup quiz. Let's see if I can squeeze it all on there. Yes, I can. Right. So I'm just going to launch this. This is your last quiz. Um, so do your best and enjoy. And if you've got any questions, take this um, time as well to compose those questions and put them in the Q&A. Um, if you don't have any questions, that's fine too. And if you need to hop off early, please grab the link for the feedback form. I'd be grateful if everybody could um, fill that in. Um, I'd also be really interested to know how many people are um, live coding along and find those links useful because I've only just started using those. So it'd be great to get some feedback about those as well as everything else. I'll give you another minute. There's quite a bit to work through again there. Um, questions four, five and six don't have any code associated. Oh, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, six questions. Four, five and six. Questions four, five and six don't have any code associated with them. All the information is in the poll. Okay, just another 30 seconds. Okay, everyone's completed it. Well done. Got some great participation in the um quizzes this week which I'm loving so um let's have a look at the answers so the first one 
this is um, an if statement. Um, neither the if nor the else if condition are met. So we get perfect output, which everyone got correct. Um, question two, um, request is set to big triangles. So the first condition is met. That task bar off. The first condition is met. So all grown up is output. Then for question three, we've got going on here. Um, so this will break out as soon as count is set to two because we're testing whether or not it's greater than or equal to two. So that means the last number that will be output is two. So well done to everyone who got that correct. Then questions four, five, and six. So what is flow control? I might have used this a bit. Um, so flow control is something that allows you to um, control the flow of your program such that it doesn't just execute from top to bottom, although it does still, um, don't, you can't go around in a loop with flow control. It's, it just determines which bit. So questions in nautical assessments are much better written than my questions. Um, so you won't get anything this vague. Um, so the answer there is it changes the flow of the program execution in, away from just top to bottom. Uh, question five, when we compare 7.0 to seven, this will return true, which everybody got. And then um, when we compare bus to taxi, it, it will compare the first letter first because it's B for bus and T for taxi. And B comes earlier in the alphabet this will return true. So it thinks the bus is less than taxi. Great. Okay. So next time. So next week, um, Trevor will be explaining how to work with arrays and hashes. Now, these are two very common data structures that you'll use a lot in Ruby. They're incredibly useful. Um, they both let you store multiple pieces of data in a single object. And there are many methods built into Ruby that can be used to interact with them. Ruby is a great language for interacting with um, arrays and hashes. Um, it, yeah, it all gets a lot more fun once you start using those. So make sure you join Trevor next week. As I've said multiple times before, please fill in the feedback. Um, I'd be grateful if everybody could be, uh, fill it in because it's really useful to know what to keep doing and perhaps what to change up. Um, someone here has told me they're live coding and it's helpful to code along and see it. Copy paste from Git is a good way to cut down on typing time as well. So thank you so much. I'm glad that worked. And that's only come about from people giving me feedback and saying that what I was doing was not working so well. So hopefully you've enjoyed this workshop and you'll be joining Trevor for next week's workshop. And I'll be moving on to the miscellaneous workshops and looking at Git. So I've got three sessions that I'm doing on Git and those ones are really fun. Um, thank you all for attending, um, taking part. And um, yeah, I've, you know, you've, you've taken part in all of the quizzes, which is great to see. And I think it just makes it a lot more interactive. So enjoy the rest of your day. It's 11 o'clock for me. Um, in the evening so it's it's now my weekend and i can rest for the night um so thank you hopefully see you all soon i'll just hang around here while you um, grab the feedback form and then i'll close everything down <laughs>